Good evening. I would like to call the Shakopee Public Schools School Board Reorganization and Regular Business Meeting to order for Monday, January 8th, 2018. Sarah, would you please call the roll? Bowerman. Yes, ma'am. Hallett. Here. McKeon. Here. Haas. Here. Romanski. Here. Tucker. Here. And Swanson. Good evening. We will move on to item two, which is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, item number three, um, before we get into the regular meeting tonight, we do have a good news item. So I would like to call up uh, to the floor, please, Rob Maynard. Rob, come on up. Uh, congratulations to Rob Maynard, Shakopee Senior High School Technology and Engineering Instructor. Maynard has been named a state winner in the 2017-2018 Samsung Solve for Tomorrow contest. Maynard's recognition comes with a $25,000 Samsung Technology prize package for the high school. The Samsung Solve for Tomorrow team said, quote, your dedication to STEAM education and bettering your community is truly inspiring to all of us. Rob? Congratulations. Thank you. Anything you'd like to uh, add at this point? Yeah, I can just explain about kind of the whole process. Uh, so for uh, Samsung runs this uh, basically competition. It's uh, throughout the whole country. And I don't know what they've been doing it for, but for the last three years, we've been state finalists. Um, the, my first year here, that was three years ago, we were uh, top five in the state. Uh, and then the last two years we won, um, we're the state winners. So which means that uh, we got to move on to the next round and that we got uh, $25,000 in Samsung products. And basically what it has been the last couple of years is I've uh, handpicked students to work with me, uh, students that I've had on um, the football field or students that have taken the engineering classes with me. I kind of. I, I hand pick them because I know the kids that um, that are going to do good and help help uh, help go on to the next step. And this year we uh, uh, we're trying to with the new construction. We're looking at uh, the, how the building's always changing and how we can help everybody navigate throughout the building. And uh, our idea right now is we saw these glasses that. Um, visually impaired students could put on and they would then be able to stream that live video to someone like a student ambassador or like kids that are sitting in the um, in the office uh, the pass runners and they would be able to communicate with them through their video and you know over the phone and that's kind of what we have to solve right now and that's that's kind of the direction that we're going in yeah. So is the equipment that they donate, do you get to pick that or is it related to your project? No, unfortunately it's not. That's something that would have been nice because it ended up, um, we already have a classroom set of tablets and that's what they gave us last year was 15 tablets which really go unused right now because there's really nothing, there's no need at high school for them. So they can repurpose them. Right, uh, but with I mean with the new academy, I can see how um, we're adding classes in the science and technology area. I can definitely see some of those classes using them for the computer hardware and for like the networking classes. How we can somehow use those and integrate them into the curriculum. Cool. All right, well, Rob, we have this fantastic certificate here, suitable for framing. All right, stack it for you. Uh, Ashley, do you want to give a shout out? Let me shake your hand. You're lined up. Congratulations. Hello, Hello. 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 <laughs> I just want to make one comment. I uh, I had the opportunity to work some with Rob over the last uh, two to three years um, and watched him work with kids. And 
really got to see a very competent uh, person who uh, relates to kids on a multiple level field. And uh, I really appreciate that and just his approach to trying to make things better here. So um, I think it's, it's uh, the shock of these benefit that you chose to come here and work and help us. And this is just a small example of the extra stuff that that he does with, with students in our district. So uh, I want to just add my congratulations on what you've done. Thanks. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item four, consideration of the agenda as presented with additions. Mm -hmm. And I'll draw your attention to just a couple of additions. Uh, one is, in particular, we're going to look at um, item 6.9, which is the um, acceptance of the bid for Pearson. And because that is currently under consent and that's something we're going to want to talk about a little bit, uh, there's some information there. We're going to move that uh, to 8.2 under old business action. If that's all right. Um, otherwise, that is it. Any other changes there? Uh, we have one language change, uh, but we can do that with the motion. Okay. All right, I will consider um, a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Angelo? Second. Second, Tony. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Move on to item five, organizational business. Uh, for those that have not been to an annual organizational meeting yet, uh, this is where it gets really fun uh, because you get to listen to uh, us rattle off a whole bunch of stuff that will put you to sleep, probably. Uh, but it's something we have to do every year. So we're going to go ahead and start with the election. We'll start at the top with 5.1. And that is the uh, election of the chairperson. So I'm going to go ahead and my friend Sarah provided me some tutorials to make sure that I get the verbiage exactly as it needs to uh, read. So I'd like to open um, nominations for office of chair. Nomination. Nominate Mr. Swanson for chair. All right, Scott Swanson has been nominated. Are there any other nominations? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Hearing none, can I have a motion to close nominations? Second motion. Oh, go ahead, Mary. Mary? Yeah. Second? Second. All right, uh, any discussion on closing nominations? Um, all in favor, in that case, of uh, Keeping Mr. Swanson as chair, signify by saying aye. 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 Close same sign. Uh, motion is passed unanimously, and I will stay put. Now we'll move on to vice chair. I'd like to entertain a uh, nomination for the office of vice chair. I'll make a nomination. Yes. I'd like to nominate Tony. Tony Poss has been nominated for vice chair. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Any other nominations for vice chair? Any other nominations for vice chair? Uh, hearing none, uh, I would like to entertain a motion to close nominations for vice chair. I'll make the motion. Moved by Matt. Second. Second by Rich. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor of uh, Tony Ponce as vice chair, signify by saying aye. 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 Same sign. That motion passes unanimously, and Tony Ponce is now elected as vice chair. Technically, at this point, uh, we'd have you swap, but we'll wait till we Elections are done. Now we'll move on to the office of clerk. I'd like to entertain a motion um, or entertain a nomination for the office of clerk. I nominate Sean Hallett. Mary is nominating Sean Hallett for the office of clerk. Are there any other nominations? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? I'd like to entertain a motion to close nominations. So moved. Go okay. Matt. Second by Angela. Any discussion? No. All those in favor of Sean Hallett as clerk, signify by saying aye. Aye. Both same sign. That motion passes unanimously. And Sean Hallett will be our, will be our clerk. We'll move on to the office of treasurer. I'd like to entertain a nomination for treasurer. I nominate Angela Tucker. Angela Tucker has been nominated for treasurer. Are there any other nominations? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? 
Now, could I have a motion to close nominations? So moved. Matt? Rich? Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Angela Tucker is treasurer. Please see five and say aye. 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 We'll save sign, and that motion passes unanimously. Angela Tucker is elected as treasurer. Now we can swap Angela and congratulations to all of On item 5.2, that's compensation. Uh, school board must adopt a resolution setting the compensation for individual members. Compensation is currently at 4,500 annually, with 500 additional for the chair and vice chair. I can entertain a motion to approve the 2018 comp uh, uh, compensation as presented. I'll make the motion to keep it the same as it was. Second. I'll second. Rich, any discussion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post name sign, motion carries. Item 5.3, designation of official depository and additional depositories. The school board must designate an official bank depository. Anchor Bank is currently the official depository for the district. We will keep all of our funds in the official depository. However, we will invest monies through a number of institutions. Additional depositories are as follows. Hometown Bank, Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank Minneapolis, U.S. Bank St. Paul, Minnesota School District Liquid Asset Fund Plus, hey, BMO Harris Bank, Irma Bank, Min Trust through M uh, PMA, and Associated Bank for OPEB Trust Transactions. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the designation of official depository and additional depositories as presented. Thank you. Tony? Second. Second that. Although, uh, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Post your sign. Motion carries. Move on to 5-4, designation of official newspaper. The school board must designate an official newspaper. The Shakopee Valley News is our official newspaper and the only local publication that meets the legal requirements for an official newspaper. I'd uh, like to entertain a motion to approve the designation of Shakopee Valley News as the official newspaper of the district. So moved. Second. Matt. Seconded by Mary. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, same sign. Motion carries. Item 5.5, five, information. Appointments to special assignments and standing committees. Um, the chair, that, this is just more informational. The chair will designate appointment to these positions. And I thank everybody in advance for providing uh, Sarah Kane your levels of interest. And we'll try to make sure that those decisions are uh, communicated out to you before the month is out. All right, item 5-6, legal assistance. Uh, the district uses more than one firm for its legal business, depending on the type of expertise that is needed. So the recommended action here is to entertain a motion to authorize the superintendent and or his designee to secure legal advice as needed during the year. I'll make that motion. Reg? I'll second. Second, Angela, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign, <coughs> motion carries. All right, moving on to 5-4, uh, use of facsimile signature. The following resolution should be adopted so the district can utilize check signing software for 2018. Um, and there is a small language change out here. The school district will utilize a check signing software and facsimile signatures for the chairperson, clerk, and treasurer to sign all checks issued by the school district except checks that are written on activity accounts. The activity account checks will be signed by the Director of Human Resources, and here's an ad, and the Director of Finance and Operations after all signatures are obtained on supporting documentation. So again, the and there is uh, Director of Human Resources and the Director of Finance and Operations. I'd like to entertain a motion to accept um, that action. Um, Sean? Okay. 
Only second, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Move on to 5 8, investment of funds. Action by the school board is needed to allow the director of finance and operations to invest surplus cash prior to the time he, she receives approval from the school board. The irregularity with which the school board district receives its payments creates an investment opportunity at certain times during the year. It's impossible to invest this cash in a timely way The pre-approval of each investment is in fact needed for the school board. So our action here that I'd like to entertain is to authorize the Director of Finance and Operations or his or her designee to give the authority to invest surplus funds without prior approval of the board within the limitations set by law and to complete the required wire transfers with notica notification to the board by the next meeting or as needed. I'll make that motion. Angela? Second. Second. Matt, uh, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed same sign. Motion carries. 5.8, electronic funds transfer. Minnesota statute 471.38, sub statute 3 and 3 requires the district to have controls related to electronic fund transfers. The recommended action here is the director of finance and operations or his or her designee be given authority to make electronic funds transfers, EFT, through the official depository. The official depository shall receive a certified copy of this authorization. The official depository will notify the district of an EFT within one day of receiving an EFT. The initiator of the EFT, the amount of the EFT, and the approval of the designated business official will be documented and reported to the school board at its next regular meeting. Anybody want to entertain that action? I'll make that motion. All right. Uh, Sean and Angela, any discussion? None. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Motion carries. Item 510, prepayment of bills. There are times when the prompt payment of bills allows us to receive a discount. In some instances, we cannot take advantage of these discounts if we must wait for formal approval of these bills. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion for this recommended action. The school board of the independent school district number 720 grants the director of finance and operations or his or her designee the authority to pay bills prior to the approval of those bills so that it may take advantage of discounts offered for prompt payment. I'll make that motion. Second. Tony, uh, any discussion? <coughs> Sorry, Matt. I was thinking about you. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Both same sign. Motion carries. Uh, item 5.11 uh, approval of P card users. And attaching your board packet was a list of purchasing card users and their spending limits, which needs to be reviewed and approved. However, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that there's a couple line items on here uh, that create a little bit of inconsistency with what we're looking at across the board. Uh, and that is we essentially have 11 or so buildings or building admins, uh, nine of which building admins have P card, uh, P cards that are um, issued to that building senior administrator, we've got two that are not. Um, that's Sweeney and Sunpath. Um, the senior, if you will, at the, in those two facilities is the uh, one of the administrative assistants. And I would like to instruct staff to go back and resolve that. We need to keep it consistent in order to have each building the same. Let's make sure that that senior leader in that building has that particular P card and is not their admin. And the other item I would ask that they review is um, there is one of six social workers um, that still has a $200, it's a very small amount, but a $200 P card. Um, the other five, I understand, ask for those P cards to be canceled, so I would ask in interest of consistency that we have number six canceled as well. Um, that is some action that I would like to see. So I would like to ask the rest of the board, is there anything else? And looking at the P card, um, spending limits or lists that we would like to see staff take another look at. So we're going to defray acting on this. I was just going to ask. Yep, we're, we're not going to act. Yep, we're going to act. We're going to kick this back to staff, ask that they um, entertain those um, modifications, bring it back on the next meeting, and we'll make one more at that time. Okay. Good. Staff, good. All right. Uh, item 5.12, uh, 12, appointment of district physicians. There are times when the district has need of physicians and services. I'd like to entertain a motion for the recommended action here, which is to appoint the physicians 
of Shakopee Park Nicollet Medical Center as school district physicians for the 2018 calendar year. So Second. Mary and Matt, uh, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed same sign. Motion carries. So on item 5.13, board meeting schedule for the calendar year. Dates and times for our calendar year 2018 are reviewed and need to be confirmed. And everybody has received uh, this calendar. The one change or addition clarification we make is the uh, February or the winter retreat that's listed on here as a TBD. We've actually, um, through a poll, determined that February 17th, a Saturday, works uh, best for everybody. So we'd like to go ahead and think of that and add that to the approved um, calendar. So, that said, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the calendar of that change. I'll make my motion. Second. Yeah. Second by Matt. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, same sign. That motion carries. Item 514, LEA designation 2018. <clears throat> the annual LEA, which is the local education agency designation, is made to ensure the maintenance of compliance with appropriate uh, federal statutes and regulations and state procedures currently in effect. The designee will also act as the responsible authority in all matters relating to its administration. I'd like to entertain a motion for the recommended action, which is to designate the superintendent as the LEA representative for 2018. So moved. John? Second. Tony? Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed save sign, and that motion carries. Item 5.15, designation of identified official with authority for MDE external user access recertification system. <clears throat> the Minnesota Department of Education, MDE, requires that school districts annually designate an identified official with authority to comply with state <coughs> access control security standard 1.0, which states that all user access rates to Minnesota state systems must be reviewed and recertified at least annually. The identified official with authority will assign job duties and authorize external users access to MDE secure systems for the local education agency. So the recommended action here, I'd like to entertain a motion to authorize Interim Superintendent Gary Anger to act as the primary identified official with authority, Iowa, interesting, and Sarah Kane as the Iowa to add and remove names only for Shockby Public School District 720-01 as presented. Could I add really quick that this language came from MDE directly? The, okay. the information and the recommended action came directly from MDE, recognizing Gary's medical absence. Um, they wanted spec specified this way with names. Okay, fair enough. I'll make a motion. I'll yeah. Second by Rich. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All the same sign, the motion carries. 5.16, policy. The district's policies need to be recognized in their present form for 2018. Recommended action here is to authorize approved policies for continuation in 2018. So moved. Mary? Second. Second by Reg. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All the same sign, the motion carries. Uh, board meetings on holidays. Uh, 5.17, the board will take action to allow board meetings on Columbus Day. So the motion here is to approve board meetings on Columbus Day in 2018 as presented. So moved. Okay. Tony, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We'll see if signed. <coughs> and motion carries. <coughs> All right. So that brings to a close the um, organizational meeting items. Bed. We'll move on to item number six, which is consent items. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve consent as provided with the uh, FDE pull up. Uh, LTFM, rather. Yeah. Um, Mary? Yeah. Second. Second. Second by Matt. Um, any additional discussion? <coughs> Mary. Uh, with Susan being. Do you care to clarify that? We'll miss Susan with the microphone. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will. Any other discussion? 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All the same sign. It's, a, it's approved. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to item seven, which is uh, an ACT testing update or business discussion items. We call Dave Barlowski and Sarah Jordan. Mm -hmm. Hello. Just to update uh, the board around our work at the high school and district wide um, around ACT and what we're doing to help prepare our kids to be college and career ready. Um, and to start with the why, um, this is our goal that we've had that we have for this year at the high school around the benchmarks for our 11th graders, the college and career readiness. If you look at 18, um, English is 18, math is 22, reading 22, science is 23. Our goal is that each year we want to be increasing our college and career readiness benchmark by 2%. Uh, if you look at our goal from last year, with many of the things that we're going to be talking about that, we did, that we're currently doing, uh, we instituted last year. And our goal last year was, as you see, for both or all four of those individual tests, uh, within our English and our reading, we had uh, we reached our goal. Math, we partially reached it. In science, we fell with, well below. And so our goal this year is to build off of where we landed for the 2016-17 school year and move into the 2017-18 by again looking at an increase of 2%. Just a little background in case you're not there. The ACT has these four major strands. The whole test is out of 36. That's the number you hear talked about quite a bit. Those benchmark scores that you see in parentheses. Um, ACT did a study and they took uh, kids in their entry level course in English, math, reading, or science in college. And then they backed math kids who got B's and C's back to what their ACT score was on those strands and said, if you had a 50% chance of getting a B or higher, 75% chance of getting a C or higher, we're gonna make that the cut score for college or career readiness. So that's where those numbers came from. Together, the composite on those is about 21 and a quarter. Okay, so that's where those came from. So then, how do we meet our goals? Uh, first one is our keeping our building the goal in front that we just talked about. Keep that in front of our staff. Um, we do that by within our staff meetings as we go through our different preparatory work. Um, that we all see that there's value and that we share that work. I appreciate that. Um, purposefulness and explicit ACT support for our, our students. Um, that's the administration and staff work that we're doing there. We'll talk more specifically in a second about how we're getting that done. That is inside and outside of the classroom, um, as well as specific content around each of the individual tests, as well as um, kind of overview of uh, strategies and tips and tricks to help be successful that um, you need to, to know before going into a standardized test like ACT. Um, providing multiple opportunities for prep for our kids and we'll, um, we wish we're partnering with our community education to offer paid as well as free uh, sessions as we ramp up for our state and district testing coming up in February. And then building stamina for high stakes tests. Last year was the first year that we offered our MCA testing in one chunk versus over uh, multiple days um, with the idea that our 10th and 11th graders in order for them to be able to sit not only do they need to know content and know Kind of strategy, but they also need to be able to have the stamina to sit for a three and a half, four hour test. So those are all things that we're purposely doing to, to get closer to our goals. And then what specifically that we're doing, I have laid out here over kind of the, the school year. Um, we have a Naviance test prep that's offered right now to all students at any time. They can get on and take full length tests at our time. They can take specific questions. Um, they can, on their phones, flash through different vocabulary words, but something that they can use at their own pace for as long, as little as they'd like. Uh, September and October, partnering with Community Ed, uh, we offered some, and, and communicated that out through uh, mailings around paid prep tutoring classes. 
in October we had our uh, the College and Career Readiness Day that had something for each level. Um, specifically around ACT, we focused our sophomores and juniors on sophomores taking an online version through the Naviance test prep. They got instant feedback. Our juniors uh, took a, a retired 15, 16 ACT test that was able to uh, pen and pencil. We tried to model, or tried to match that day as closely as we could to an actual testing day. Um, and then they ended up getting those scores back about a month or so later uh, with score back sessions that came with that. Sarah, before you move on, the Naviance test prep, mm -hmm. there are multiple tests, full length tests. So if a student really got into this and they want to test three or four times, that's the same test over. Nope, there's seven different tests that are out there. Mm -hmm. And then as they start it, they have a timer that once they start the test, they have that much time to just uh, moving to January and February, where we are now, um, Community Ed is offering some prep sessions paid uh, through the community. Um, we have our student panel that will be at the end of January, a month prior to the testing, that we're bringing in kids that have not only done well in the ACT, but showed perseverance over the multiple times that many of them have taken the test. Some of them have taken the test three or four times. What we would look for for the kids that will be a part of that student panel are kids that showed growth and and got better each time I took a test. We'd like to get them in front of our, our student body, not just the 36 kids or the, the kids that have the high scores and just innately are just have got it down. Um, we want kids that showed what are you doing and what are you putting in as far as work to, to get that improved score. And also for kids to hear from their own peers the benefits that that brings from college acceptance letters to scholarship money. Um, those are all things that I think that most juniors and sophomores um, as, e as well as even seniors would like to hear. Um, we're starting some bell ringers in the beginning of February. These are things that will be instituted in our content specific classes. So if you're a math teacher and you're teaching algebra, uh, a few times a week they'll be starting their class with an actual ACT question. They'll take some time to go through that and then move on to their curriculum. And what we're hoping to do is that if you're in calculus or in algebra or um, if you're a, a socialist, we're focusing with reading. English is focusing around the English portions that we have things that are trying to be as much as we can aligned with the curriculum that they're teaching, along with uh, the ACT questions that again we know from research that shows how important it is uh, that they get opportunities to see the actual questions and how to tackle those. Okay. And then uh, we have ACT prep sessions that are that we're going to be offering. A number of our teachers have stepped up to be helpful in that. Dave is one of those. Um, we have an overview ACT kind of a focus specifically specifically for kids that are under 16 um, that just probably have never experienced when they've taken our practice ACT in the fall. We have those kids that have that 16 or lower. They've never taken a test. They don't know what the ACT you would expect it to do. Now if they're a junior um, and they have this free test that's available to them, having some knowledge around the importance and um, strategies around that. So we're specifically inviting kids that are, are there. We're also looking at another group between the scores of 17 and 21 that are right below that college and career readiness cut score that we're targeting to see if they would like to attend our sessions as well to kind of give a re-up or boot camps, if you will, to, to get ready. And those will all be happening after school um, uh, from like 3.15 to 4.30 or like two and a half weeks prior to the ACT test. And then the last thing is that we have the actual test this year. We actually moved up from last year. Normally it's been in April. We are, with recommendation from our counselors, changing to uh, uh, February 27th. This is an ACT plus writing. Uh, this is offered to all 11th graders and it is free of charge for all, all of our junior students. Um, counselors have asked to have this test moved up because what was happening is that they were getting the test taken in, in mid to late April. Um, they wouldn't get the, the test scores back until uh, very late May or early June and for them to be for students to one know do I need to take it again or to even get some support for the counselors was really non-existent and so by pushing it up to the early spring administration we're able to give us counselors some opportunities to kind of look at now what how do we help uh, support your goals and strategies to maybe retest if they're looking at it for another testing date. Um, this date uh, because it's the, the plus writing and we also are doing the accommodations. Some of them are taking more than one test for that, that day. One test as far as if you're in an accommodate test and you have times two as far as timing code or, or more than that, 
some kids will take just the math or the reading or the intersection, and then they'll wait for the next few weeks to take the rest of the test. Uh, because of the test and the length of it, we are not offering school that day for our 10th and 12th graders. They won't be attending school because pretty much every teacher, para um, that we have available will be involved in some advisory, proctoring, monitoring role for us. And that is what we've done the last two years as well. And in the other district assessment coordinators that I connect with around the metro, that's probably the most common model that they use as well. You're supposed to turn off all the bells. It's got to be this very quiet, it's kind of an intense atmosphere, and there really be no other way to operate this. So that's what's happening. So curious, um, students that have IEPs, how, how do they take them? So they uh, are right now currently case managers and counselors are, are submitting all their accommodation requests to ACT. ACT makes kind of their own final approval or not approval of each of the accommodation requests. Um, again, it, it, it's all around timing codes for the most part, unless there is things like a bigger script or something's read to them. Um, all that gets put together and based on the timing that dictates how long or how, how many tests they'll get done in a day. If kids are time and a half over multiple days, we try to say take a test, take a break, come back, and we try to get two in on a day that we have designated so we're not going to be causing, as we resume classes on the next day, to take kids out of a class period. So we'll probably go on for the next couple of weeks to try to get those done because some of the kids have these timing codes that Sarah talks about that could be time and a half, double time. Sometimes it's you still have the triple time. There's some stop the, stop the clock as well where kids can use that time that they control like more. So there's all based on what's in the student's IEP to your original question. And, it, and actually we started applying for these probably in November. And it, it's a very involved process to get this many kids with their accommodations. And new this year is uh, second language students. EL students can also apply for accommodations as well. So it's not just kids that have, have an IEP that can get these now. So it's a lot. It turns out to be a lot of kids. What's been our compliance, for lack of a better term, in the pool of 11th graders for the last couple of years taking in percentage? Really high. So we've had, um, I'll bet you it's, it's got to be between 95 and 100 percent take it, which kind of is a good, I think, lead into uh, the last slide, I think. Nope. Uh, I have to do some check this. The slide after this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. So on this slide, um, it's changed three years in a row how this has been handled. In 15-16, the state required all juniors to take it and paid for it. They paid for it out of a settlement with Pearson Education that the state was paid when there was all those testing glitches the one year. So this was their multi-million dollar settlement. They funded it. Then last year, MDE paid for it, and we were required to offer it. So kids were not required to take it to graduate. Now, it's as a district, we had to offer it to them. Kids can refuse. Parents can refuse. Um, some kids that are happy with their scores already just choose not to take it, and some kids choose not to take it for other reasons. This year they changed it again and they're only paying for students that receive free or reduced price lunch. The district is picking up the cost for the others. In checking with uh, other metro districts, that is the, what the majority of them are doing. You do have an option as a district to charge kids. You could say, you guys get it for free because that's what it, the Department of Ed is paying. Everybody else pays. I don't, I haven't heard of anybody doing this where they're saying it's a $62.50 test, we'll split it with you. But that is an option, you could do that as well. So for us, this turns into about 400 kids at 62.50 and we felt like that was the right thing to do. But depending on our situation, something that we need to put out there as well that we wanna talk about. Okay, I think that's it, that's it. Unless you have any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, changing the order of visits, change our science test scores. I'm not going to look at Nancy a little bit. I, I don't even know the other. 
that so Nancy would be. ACT has a recommended scope and sequence of courses that they talk about that will um, typically show better achievement results. And students who take physics, um, chemistry, and bio show better results than those that just have like physical science and biology or are missing a physics experience or chemistry. So our new, rec our new scope and sequence should help in this area, both on MCAs and on ACTs. Uh, those kids are in chemistry right now, so they won't be taking the test this year. They'll be taking it next year. Uh, the, and we'll see if the research pans out that in terms of getting better results, but that would be the hope. That was part of the work behind it. We do have three, only three sections of AP biology, so I'm assuming that our scores for the science portion of it yeah. will dramatically increase for our yeah, juniors this year. This year. <laughs> Smaller sample size and uh, students that are very capable of doing well. Sarah or Dave, uh, when do most of the other districts in town offer the test? And I'll explain why I'm asking. April. April. So I'm piggybacking on Mary's question because in this case we're moving it up by six weeks, let's say. So theoretically that's a little less time in the classroom, a little less education and learning they might have, which again theoretically might impact the scores that we thought about that. I know why we're moving it up and I actually applaud that, but is there any potential downside? There is. There, we knew going into it as we had various very difficult conversations around knowing that there's, there's always a, you know, Robert Peter to pay Paul. You're <laughs> making decisions that are maybe good on one side, but then you're also taking uh, instruction time away from teachers that should be giving more time with their kids. Um, I don't know if we'll stick with this. It's something that we thought we would try to see how does it, and, and then even get feedback from families and students from this perspective with the engagement that they'll have with counselors and see does that outweigh the other. We've never done it this way, so I, I guess, We'll let the data speak for itself and, and move from there. Yeah, and I think the dri the real driver of this was, because I felt the same thing. I, I was hesitant to make the move. The counselors assured me that this would give them time to work individually with kids and help them do it again. Because what happens is, if you're a junior and you take it then, and you start applying into the fall, you miss that summer test, now you're into the September or October, you're pushing up against when you really are getting your your college applications in. So this will give those a, a lot of kids through help with, uh, from our counselors a chance to take it that one more time before they need to apply. So it, it, it is. It, I think what Sarah said is right. It's, it, it's a tough call. But our counselors felt like this was really the right thing to do. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> All right, we'll move on to item uh, 5.2, construction update. Uh, we have got a new, oh, hey, have you presented it here before? Uh, very early on when Vaughn was starting out. Okay, you want to introduce yourself? And I won't take your thumbnail. Okay. My name's Aikalot Sobopat. I'm with ICS Consulting. I just go by A. Makes it a lot easier. <laughs> Spelling test will be after the board meeting. <laughs> All right, I've put together a uh, PowerPoint for the team. I you know that visuals help in, uh, in my explanation. So we've hit some major milestones this past winter break. We've turned over the common space. We've also turned over the field house. So uh, exciting news there. Uh, the first slide I have here is a shot of the corridor looking into the uh, expanded common space. So on the left-hand side there is the new fabrication lab. So this is a new corridor that connects the old building with the new athletics wing. Uh, also, I just have to stop here. One of these is the rendering, and one of them is the real picture. <laughs> right. If you didn't know, <laughs> right. it'd be hard to tell which is which. That's how close the the result is to what you rendered quite some time ago. Correct. Yeah. And the only giveaway is the exit sign. Right. <laughs> Right. You get all in a render of the exit I thought that's a beam me up, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> so students get to use this corridor now, so it's a nice shortcut. They don't have to go all the way around like mm -hmm. they did before, so I'm sure that they're, they're happy about that. Mm -hmm. Here's a shot of our learning stairs. So on the left-hand side, you've got the Genius Bar 
got the uh, learning stairs, so all the finishing of the wood floors and the learning stairs is now complete, so this is all opened up. The temporary construction wall is now down, so it's, I don't know if you'd be, you're heading there, but it's a, it's a big space. I can't believe that this used to be your uh, competition gym. Can you explain what the Genius Bar is? Genius Bar, so people come when, um, and assuming the curriculum is, uh, students can come and help, just like Apple, Apple Store, come and have to help with It's where PCs. kids will come to get technology support for their devices. There will be kids that will help serve them, as well as like tech uh, paraprofessionals and others. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Is the learning still fully functional? It is. We just, it, this was taken as early in the morning. The uh, caution tape has now been taken on, so it's not operational. Next slide is another view, so this is looking at the stage. Uh, then you can see the fabrication lab underneath the, uh, the upper common space, and again looking at the, the genius bar. And we haven't uh, ordered the TVs yet, but that there is completed um, infrastructure for TVs for that stage, so you can see the black speakers there. Um, there is an open house on Wednesday that they'll be using some of the space in some of the upper, upper common space as well. So now going into, from the expanded common space into the presentation spaces, this is a thing called the Innovation Hub. Um, you're looking at the Genius Bar there on the right hand side, you kind of see the countertop. Uh, and this is looking from one of the presentation spaces. So actually all those boxes right there are just TV boxes, they're actually installing all the TVs in there currently. Here's another shot, so if you're looking from the Genius Bar into the presentation spaces, so you can see the size of the TVs and the market boards for those uh, uh, presentation spaces. Now heading out of the Innovation Hub, going towards the culinary arts and the coffee shop, so this is outside, so where you'd have seating for the coffee shop, the booths, outside of the culinary art space. Um, science is yet to be installed, but this is all turned over, completed. And all of the furniture in these spaces are being delivered uh, MLK Day, so Martin Luther King Day the 15th. Looks like culinary arts has been fully equipped. Yes. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have another shot in there yeah. as well. So here's a shot looking into the coffee shop <coughs> on the north side there. You see the uh, the wall, all of the finishes are there. So we passed inspection last Thursday, so health inspection we passed. So we're able to uh, function out of the space. And we have training in the space set up, or, or going to be set up this week, and then uh, from there we turn it over. So let's semester start day, we can be using the space. Here's a shot inside the actual coffee shop here. You see all the equipment's up and running. Outer top, six place. It's a beautiful, beautiful space for all small ways, actually. So, the only thing left to do really is uh, work with Dev and figure out how to use inside engineer. Is that a place where will it be open like before school, during lunch, and after school? Do, does anybody know what the logistics of that are? Is it someplace where? In between six and seven hour, I could go get a coffee. I don't know the logistics. It's, it's, I've had a discussion with uh, Deb about that. Um, we're going to experiment a little bit with different times of the day and when we actually can make it uh, self sufficient rather than having to supplement the cost. So, uh, I, you know, before school, over the lunch hours possibly after school a while. And then we'll try some different, she's gonna try some different extended hours too, but we're gonna start out small and just work to figure out what really works and what the need is. So here is a rendering and photograph. So this is just right outside the culinary art space uh, where the dumbwaiter would be. So you can see on the left-hand side, again, you see that temporary construction wall there, so you can see how that opened it up to the existing common space. And 
imagine here's your shot of inside the culinary arts. Again, TVs are being installed. If they're not already installed today, they'll be installed tomorrow. So you can see it's all fully furnished. Uh, again, health inspection passed Thursday, so uh, we will be ready for operation uh, the first day of the semester. Here's a shot of a second level corridor going through and heading towards the athletics wings. You can see the, uh, the stairwell and then our open uh, circle space down to the first level. You do just have to finish up some of that tile around the, uh, the uh, handrail there. Here is a photograph of the upper level commons. Again, TVs are being installed, I think. Taken in the morning, they're being installed this afternoon. Again, the furniture will be delivered the 15th of January, so it'll be fully furnished. Did you take these pictures today? I did. Okay, because I was there. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the angle. it's the angle you take them. Oh, it must be. <laughs> And again, they're uh, they as an open house on Wednesday, they utilize the projector, so we'll be ready for that. The big one final uh, learning series? Both, but there's two projectors up here as well that are. Oh, there are? Yeah. And the open house is for who? The open house is for Showcase. Showcase. Showcase is on the 10th. So anyone can go. I'm just saying. All right, now this is a photograph of the interior field house. So they actually started using and practicing the space uh, last Tuesday already, and they actually had a uh, girls' youth tournament this past weekend. So uh, John Jenke said it went very smooth, had some training on the equipment and uh, AV already. So and they have another tournament this upcoming uh, weekend for youth boys. It's good to get it done. Exciting. <laughs> One of my employee's daughter played in the tournament weekend and she said it was absolutely amazing Great. and the ability to be able to see into the field house and the other gym yes. so they could watch two teams at the same time yep. she they really liked it yeah they said all 10 courts were being used at one time so wow. it's amazing yeah wow. i was jealous you guys see it for me <laughs> and here's our shot from up above on the upper level track so the one thing that they do need to complete is some of the striping yet so that has yet to be finished. But the track's all been laid. Yep, all properly. the flooring's been laid. It's just a matter of laying out the painting. And, and we're trying to work around making sure that the, the smell is, is um, tolerable. So that's kind of the hard part that we're scheduling around right now. Okay. Here's the front entrance view. So if you look to the left, that's what we're calling the, the new East Tower. So that's where your new administration will be on that first level there. So all that brick is complete. Right now they're working on uh, steel for the canopy and roof decking. And then towards the end of the month they'll be working on the metal panels and the windows. Right now they're doing a lot of the HVAC and fire special work within the, the interiors right there. And the on the right hand side you can see that's the uh, our studio stage and they're working within the uh, footprint for duct work and so forth. So all the brick is done on this side as well. So hey, the uh, cold snap that we've had here, is that created any issues for? Uh, there's always product productivity levels that go down, but they're, I mean, they're accounted for. Um, they've got uh, heating for these uh, spaces. So uh, when you go into the spaces, they're actually <coughs> well, well heated. The only issue is if we went into is like timing of a roof membranes but no it's uh but again you can kind of bounce around as long as people are inside they're taking pretty good safety measures with the cold here's a shot from the northwest of the arts and communication edition again all the bricks been done on this right now they're working on the canopy on the left hand side although we call it the eyebrow Again, all the bricks done, so they're working on the roofing, roof decking as well. Majority of the steel is being uh, erected as well. So 
So here's a shot if you were uh, standing kind of, kind of by the main entrance, looking back at the new auditorium and the new studio stage. So what's going on here is uh, you can see the poly on the right hand side, that's um, weather protection for them to install the exterior brick on that curb wall. So all of the utilities are done in this space. So, um, probably four weeks you'll see the concrete floor being poured in, in this space. Here's a look into the auditorium. You kind of see the, uh, the flooring is being put in place for the, uh, the risers. All of the spaces is, is enclosed now, so we got roof decking in here. Um, by the end of January, we'll have a concrete floor in here as well. And they'll start doing the duct work and all the other uh, HVAC work in. Here's a shot looking into our studio space. Uh, concrete floor has been poured in this area. You can see that curtain wall framing uh, being put up at the end of the month. You'll have the curtain walls put in place. Uh, windows will be put in place at the end of January as well. So we're working on uh, duct work, hydraulic piping in this space. Can they pour concrete uh, temperature independent? It'll be for curing. For curing purposes, you want to have it. You want to have it heated. So the, the cold snap didn't inhibit anything, and if we have another one, when you talk about floors being poor, we have ways to yeah, see, they call it, it. They call it heat, um, heat protection. Right. Well, yes, no, no, no one close it, they'll have, they've got the gears pumping in the space. So the only spaces that don't have flooring right now is the, uh, the spaces right outside the new 2D, 2D and 3D arts. Also having everything at floors. Here's another shot of the studio space again, just duct work and hydraulic piping going into the space, along with electrical. So mostly uh, infrastructure going in right now. Then jumping over to our south tower, you can see the exterior work. All the windows are in. We're working on the curtain wall for the stairs, putting in the stair um, framing as well. By the end of the month, we'll be putting up some metal panels and then finishing up the roofing and uh, roof coping. Here's a shot inside of the south tower. So this is on the first floor, one of the resource areas. So in this area right now, they're just they're painting, so they've got all their infrastructure in. Just a matter of the drywall uh, and walls being painted at this point. <coughs> is this the last um, classroom tower? Well, we got two simultaneously. You got this one that's called the South Tower, and then you got P, which is the East Tower, which is the administration area, too. Oh, all right. Well, then we're in the ninth graders. The Freshman the, Academy? Yeah. Yeah, that is in most of the East Wing, East second and third floor. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then the last slide is just another shot of the resource area. Again, just painting going on in here, and then uh, follow up with some ceiling grid and finishes. A lot further along than where we were last year with the south, Southwest Tower. Any questions? How are we doing time-wise? Like I said, we're doing uh, very well. Uh, this time around, we don't have walls up. We've got all the brick, you know, all the towers. It's hard to get the auditorium, but we're not scheduled with that. So. Say we're ahead of schedule with the two classroom towers, right on schedule with the auditorium. We have a bike meeting on Wednesday, um, but so you can tip your hands a little bit on the budget. We were sitting on a healthy contingency balance. I assume that hasn't changed since our last meeting. Right, so we've got, we've got sign change order 14 now in place, and that we're still moving on the change order 15. <laughs> and, you know, we've got a couple of other items, but there's no big ticket items. So we continue to be on our other budget. Good. Uh, can you speak quickly about the uh, little outage water issue that we had? Oh yes. So last Thursday we had an unplanned outage. Uh, contractor was carrying some pipes, accidentally hit our uh, main line. So the valve was, uh, the RPC valve was was busted and it was spewing out water. We had some electrical panels that were nearby, so we wanted to take some precautions, shut off the water. Uh, we did not get validation or confirmation that 
is going to be done by one. So we, uh, John, Jeff made the executive decision to, to uh, have an early release due to that. And Shaw Longquist has made sure that any costs associated with this, they're going to they're going to front up. And again, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, and fortunately, after the buses had left that ten minutes after that, the water was back up and running. But we didn't, we couldn't confirm that it was going to be done at that time. It's a great decision made. Thanks for that update. Thank you. Thank you. Else, Ray? What major things are yet to be done? What major things? Yeah. So we've got the two classroom towers. We've got the south classroom tower, and then we've got the east classroom tower that consists of the administration space and then our huge arts and communication wing. So that's a, we've got a new band room in there. You've got 2D and 3D art science classrooms in there as well. Um, the studio space that I showed you there. So that's the new space and then within the existing footprint you still have this, the upgrades to the servery, the cafeteria space and the kitchen and then areas inside the new admin spaces are going to be kind of uh, remodeled to accommodate freshman academy and uh, other manufacturing areas as well so still got a lot left to do. Are we going to have a address the person's item? Uh, actually, I was wondering that. Are you prepared to address the Pearson roof, or is that we've got uh, we've got budget numbers and yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, in that case, <laughs> since you're here, let's go ahead and jump to eight point two. Okay. That was said in here, so. Yep. Okay. So I think the bit came at eight sixteen six or eight thirteen six hundred. So the original budget was at eight hundred forty thousand. So we came in almost thirty thousand under budget. Like that. Questions. This isn't a really attractive uh, deal. So, what repair would we have to do? Schematics are included on here. Stock bid package. Have we worked with Palmer West Construction in the past? Yeah, we're going to do Okay. Most uh, responsible bid. So, then I guess we'll learn a new, uh, we'll make a new relationship. Uh, any questions for A regarding, or any other questions regarding this particular Pearson roof here? What's the timing on doing this work? The timing? Yeah. It's going to be probably this summer. Yeah, it's Anything else? All right, in that case, let's just go ahead and take action right now. We may, um, 8.2, I'd like to indicate a motion to approve the um, bid from Palmer West Construction as presented. Rich and Tony, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. It passed. Sorry. Right. Thanks, Abe. Appreciate it. Hey, thank Thanks. you. Thanks to the team. Yes. Thank you, Abe. All right. Okay, we'll move on to back up 273. Uh, acting here on Superintendent Schwinn. Let's look it up. Okay, so we have uh, talked in uh, the past couple of months about. Uh, looking at all of our different uh, financial aspects as much as we can. Uh, we are nearing being able to provide a revised budget for 2017-18. Uh, we've been able to uh, check the validity of some of the assumptions uh, that were made in setting up that budget. And what we have uh, determined is, is that um, we actually are looking at having not uh, an addition to the uh, fund balance or having revenues over expenditures. Right now we're looking at a, a $400,000, $500,000 deficit in just this year. In other words, expenditures of about four dollars to $500,000 over what revenues we are projecting to come in. Now I will... Uh, I will tell you that we are, um, well, let's I'll personalize it. I will tell you that I am uh, normally pretty conservative by nature, and I believe that we have um, done a really good job of ferreting out everything that's going on with the 1718 budget. I want to thank Suzanne and her staff for all their work 
and also suggestions from other people about where we're at with some things. Um, I would say that that, uh, that that deficit that we're looking at is, I would think, uh, worst case scenario, and we're actually hopeful that we're going to be uh, better off than that. I think there are things that we're presently doing to uh, tighten our belts and control some expenditures that are going to help, but we also don't want to miss on the side that there will be surprises. Um, I said in the past that uh, with the size budget we have of between 90 and 100 million dollars, you're going to, if you're off a quarter percent, that's 450 thousand. So what we've tried to do is really hone in everything, make sure we we have an understanding of what everything is. I think it's also important to point out that um, we're going to probably be better off from an unrestricted or unassigned uh, portion of our fund balance at the end of 17-18 compared to 16-17. Some of those redis uh, restricted expenses that were shown in, of course, our last audit, um, those move in and out and it changes the mix of what your uh, fund balance is between the restricted and uh, unassigned. And, and I believe that uh, we actually um, will will have an improved situation as far as that ratio is. So I think that's a positive. Um, and as I said, we're also attempting to um, make re reductions. We've, we've looked at some transportation things. We have reassigned some people to cover uh, positions that opened up because of a, uh, in some cases, a medical leave or some other kind of situation. And I, and I think that also will end up uh, helping us. Um, but until you get to the end of the year, to you, until you get to make sure that you know exactly what's happening, I think it's better to take a conservative approach and try and make sure that we're not going to get the negative surprise. I'm not saying that there couldn't be a negative surprise, I'm just saying that I, I, I don't believe that we'll see that with this um, revised budget. We worked with the Finance Committee uh, on that. We're also going to talk to the uh, Citizens Finance Group with that. Um, and then we'll come back with a recommendation at the February meeting as far as the actual dollar amounts. Um, some of the other things that we're presently doing regarding budget, and I'll talk a little bit more in a couple minutes about um, the 1819 uh, assumptions. We're, uh, we've been doing a lot of other work as well, looking at uh, where are we with some of our expenditures and are they in line with other districts so we've selected four or five districts in the metro area that have similar populations to ours similar demographics to ours um, all of these uh, districts of the four or five have um, more operating levy than we do so there's probably some there's definitely some influence from that but we couldn't find uh, people that exactly fit our profile, but we got as close as we could. And, and what we're uh, presently looking at, again, uh, Keith and his uh, HR people are really helping with this, is we're, we're looking at things like uh, administrative uh, positions versus the number of pop the student population, um, instructional support to the student population, um, district staff, to the student population, uh, teaching staff, uh, other types of expenditures for uh, the student population. And those are some of the things that will help us then make assumptions about what we have to do with next year. So uh, I, would, I would say that uh, while we would like to be adding money to the fund balance at the end of the year, and I'm not saying that that isn't possible right now, uh, my best estimate is that we're going to we're going to see that that uh, deficit at the end of the year. Uh, hopefully, it'll be better. Um, which means that we will not be able to add to our fund balance. But again, the unassigned fund balance I think will be better uh, uh, at the end of the year. That leads me to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is the. Uh, 
Pearson sixth grade center, but before I get into that, are there any questions about 17 and 18, what procedures we've used, or any of the information that I've provided? It's pretty much in line with what I was intimating before, but now we feel uh, confident that we've honed in and that that's a, those are good numbers. Um, however, they're conservative, and hopefully they're going to be better. Any questions by board members? The plan is, John, to uh, the, the finance committee was exposed to a little bit of this more. The plan is to have the learning session and then in preparation for the February meeting to come back with the revised, revised budget. budget for the board to dive into as well as see the okay. This analysis that you're doing of um, comp districts, that's information that we can use moving forward in setting future budgets. Right, and, and I will discuss that a little bit more when we get to the assumptions uh, on the uh, agenda under new business for 18 and I'll comment about that a little bit more. That's a good point for you to raise, and uh, I appreciate you saying that. Anything else? Okay, so with the understanding that if we do have a, a deficit budget this year, um, that's going to carry over to next. Um, it goes back to that pattern thing that I've been uh, speaking about uh, regularly, and that uh, our pattern is still moving toward more expenditures than revenues. So we need to change that. Uh, one of the things that was brought up um, and offered, I think first off, as I said before, through the Citizens Finance Committee, was uh, not opening a building. Uh, in this case, it would be Pearson Sixth Grade Center when we move the sixth graders up. So we've, uh, we've been looking at that in the last month since you directed me to come back with a recommendation regarding that particular thing because it's a, uh, first of all, it's a, it's, it's a big thing to do and it has, it has impacts and you have to weigh those versus the uh, financial advantages to doing it and uh, I believe that um, that we determined what that could be. Uh, my recommendation tonight is that we not open uh, Pearson after the sixth grade has moved to the middle school, which will be the middle schools, and the ninth grade moves to the high school. Now, I'm going to talk about a few things here to put this in context. Number one, our student population is not growing dramatically next year, nor nor is it shrinking. It, we're, we're pretty stable, and we talked about some of the reasons for that like fewer children born during the recession and that's now in the middle of our, uh, of our district. And some of the proposed building hasn't taken off yet, which is bringing in uh, increased numbers. So you have to think about it like the same number of students, but how are we going to serve those students? And how do we maximize the student population versus the square footage of buildings with the over and those types of things. Um, and how do the buildings best fit uh, the student population? Uh, our elementaries, we have two that are very full and two that are not full, or three that are not full. And uh, by not opening Pearson, we actually gain some advantages by having larger student populations in those buildings to spread the overhead in those buildings over more students. And while we would like to see two of our buildings have uh, fewer students, uh, the other three can definitely take some more, but I'm not recommending that we start shifting attendance areas when we know that within a year or two we're gonna probably have to do it again and how many times do we wanna do that. Secondly, um, it's been clear to me that most of the families in the district are happy with the buildings that they're in. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, an understatement, I believe. So um, even though they're crowded and our staff uh, is dealing with some, some issues there, I, I really believe that we're okay and we're not, we're okay for sure in three buildings and in the two that are full, we've been full in the past in, in that type of building. And so I think we're, I think we're gonna be okay there if we worked in a financial crunch, then I think the situation would be different. But 
I believe that it's reasonable to to not <coughs> move forward with making uh, Pearson an elementary building. Uh, we've done some uh, looking at costs uh, and what that actually saves us. Um, the point that I think I would make is is that the before we start getting into reduction mode or cutting mode, we just need to look at kind of what is the general situation. And the general situation is is that moving the sixth grade up to the junior highs to make them middle schools and bumping the ninth grade out up to the high school, our student population really isn't changing. And the number of staff we're going to need without having to do some belt tightening means that the sixth grade teachers that would go be spread out into the elementary buildings, um, if we were trying to just spread out sixth grade across the elementaries versus moving them to the middle school, the number of staff isn't really going to change whether they're working in a ninth grade center, whether they would be working out in over six buildings if we weren't moving to the ninth grade or to the middle schools and the sixth graders moving to the two now middle schools that that teacher population isn't going to change so right now we've taken that out of the equation we're just going to make the assumption before we have to do belt tightening for next year is that the number of staff to cover next year's sixth grade we have and that staff is just going to move and that's true for some of the other positions special positions, uh, specialists at uh, Pearson. Um, but then we looked at what are the things that um, we would be able to reduce if we were going to take Pearson out of service for a year and leave the other things. And we came up, uh, we worked on that, um, and I believe we're, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, oh, there's probably seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars worth of expenditures that we would be able to reduce if we were just moving the sixth grade up, the ninth grade up, okay, by by shuttering that. And that includes things like energy and, and administrative positions, custodians. Um, food service, all those kinds of things. Well, then if you look at what kind of expenses do we have by moving into the high school uh, and putting in what we projected to be the needs for additional staffing, like additional security people, another assistant uh, principal, uh, um, support staff, um, you know, custodians, all those kinds of things. Um, we put a price tag on that of about a million two hundred thousand to do that. Okay, so by moving the students and not opening Pearson, we have about an eight hundred thousand dollar pot of staff and other kinds of support things that will go to help us open the high school with the type of uh, staffing and other need things that we need. Now that doesn't mean that. That 400,000 between the Pearson staff and the proposed high school staff can all be done. We know that with a tight budget, we're going to have to make reductions for what we would like to have there versus what we're going to be able to afford to have there. But I think you can see that by moving that kind of staff, uh, diverting uh, operational costs like custodial. Uh, cleaning supplies and the energy and stuff like that. Um, by doing that, we actually really serve about the same number of kids. We have a facility that's probably going to be, um, you know, better serving the ninth grade and the sixth grade going to the middle school. We could say that that's being better served. And I guess the point I'm making is I think that's a good a good switch. I think it I think that makes sense and as the elementary population grows and we need to bring 
Pearson on and we can spread some of those overhead costs over more students. I think that makes sense. Uh, so my recommendation is, is that we don't open Pearson and we take as many staff and support services and other types of expenses that we would save by not fully staffing and, and doing Pearson and moving elementary kids there. And you got to remember that we're not going to necessarily cut too many expenses in those other five buildings if we take some students out of there because you're only taking part of the students. You're not taking a large enough group that would really be a lot of savings. Plus you, you need to add a high potential because we have high potential at the elementary buildings. So now there's a potential, a position like high potential that we'd have to add. So opening Pearson actually would also cost us some money. So to me again, it makes sense not to open Pearson to migrate all of those support people, uh, teachers for example, to the middle school, which is now the junior high, and then the ninth grade people that serve students at the ninth grade will move to the high school and we'll have a nice transition there of people. Now, we're moving people and it's always difficult to move. I just sold a house and bought a house not that long ago and I will tell you that it's a bit of a pain to move, I get all that, but uh, I think it does make sense for us in this particular case. Um, so I don't, there will be about, uh, I think it's fair to say that there's going to be about $200,000 to $250,000 worth of things that don't move well to the other building. So that, that's going to be part of the reduction that will help us meet our deficit for 2018-19. But you just, not everything really moves. I could let that go and not bring it up, but I think it's important to know that there are some things that would be in Pearson uh, positions or whatever that will not translate to one of the other buildings. And I, I need to be upfront with that because you need to understand it. Um, so we have approximately uh, a $400,000 difference between taking the people from Pearson, moving them to the middle schools, taking the ninth grade people and moving them to the high school, taking some of the Pearson support staff and things to the high school. Um, we're still going to be on uh, what the preferred staffing and things at the high school would be we're about four hundred thousand dollars short um, i'm here to tell you that we can't afford that so we're going to have to make reductions in order to to not have to absorb that that big a jump um, and we're going to probably have to absorb some of the energy costs because we can't quite we can't make those up by by uh, just not opening peers so is it as good news? Is it good news? I'd say no. Is it uh, a reasonable position to take uh, considering where we are at financially? Uh, I believe it is because if we don't do that, you're looking at a huge cut across uh, the district where we could mitigate that by holding on Pearson for a couple of years and um, taking advantage of it. Uh, I'm going to stand for questions and then the board can decide how you want to uh, respond to this recommendation about uh, not opening Pearson as an elementary school. Barry? What two schools, elementary schools, are over capacity? Uh, yeah, they're over capacity this year. And which two? Which two? Uh, I don't Jackson. know. Eagle Creek, Eagle, Creek and Jackson. Eagle Creek and Jackson. Okay. Yep. And I will, I, I pointed this out before, but I can remember when Red Oak was that full. You know, the reality is if people keep moving around and they don't have the same number of kids at each grade level, I, you know, it'd make it a whole lot simpler. And if they just stay in their homes or they move as soon as their children moved out of the elementary, so we got somebody in there with other elementary kids, this would be a whole lot easier. But it, it doesn't work that way. And to me, um, Red Oak is a great example. We opened Red Oak uh, 
that was the first building that that I had to uh, help pass the uh, bond issue for. We built that building. Uh, it started out not real full. It got real full real quick. It got over capacity pretty quick. Right and there. now it's down, and now it's down. Um, and that's just the evolution of what happens. <laughs> Uh, even with the adjustments to attendance boundaries that we made, that's still an area that basically has aged. And when you have these new developments like Southbridge was, you get younger people in there, and they're the ones with the younger kids, the elementary kids, and those kids matriculate through, and away, away you go, you get to that situation. So um, I'm sure that for Eagle Creek or for Jackson, at some point, that could also happen. However, we don't know the implications of all of these um, development things that are out there. And uh, even waiting a couple of years to open Pearson is gonna allow you to look at where those are and make some better judgments about where more students might be coming from and where they might need to go. Um, so, you got two full ones, and since we've been that full in the elementaries in the past, and since uh, we're working right now, and frankly, everybody seems to be relatively happy with those two buildings and what's being done there, um, I think it's worth uh, leaving them as full as they are, and I don't think we're gonna see a whole lot more uh, growth into those two buildings in the next six months. And we may have to suggest that if someone wants to do an interdistrict transfer to one of those buildings, we're not gonna allow that. There's other buildings to transfer if you need to transfer. Or if you're coming in as an open enrollment. We, I think one of the things we have to study is how do we wanna deal with that? Um, and if we wanna put some restrictions on where we have people. I know I, for one, have been um, pretty anxiously waiting to hear what you were going to recommend on this. And after hearing what you have to say, and honestly, just my own um, little pencil and paper stuff I've been doing by myself, it feels like the right choice for our district right now situation that we're in. I also know that there are a lot of families that are out there right now, uh, individual families who are, who might do a little happy dance mm -hmm. when they hear this, um, knowing that the kids get to stay where they are for at least another year. How long will Pearson, you recommend Pearson to be closed? How long, what, Mary, I'm sorry? How long do you recommend that prison remain closed? Uh, I'm recommending one year with a reevaluation in about uh, before the first of next year. I think it depends on the student population and what's coming in. Secondly, how your uh, financial picture clears up or bounces back. There will be a number of things, criteria, that you would look at, and this could be, um, if, if the projections that I'm looking at and, and if the numbers continue to stay about the same for, uh, it could be at least two years before you have to look at seriously opening that building. And I think your decision tonight about keeping it maintained, I actually believe that Pearson's a very nice building. I think if you're in there and you're, you see kids in there and you see teachers working, uh, I believe the environment is is good in that building. Um, I, hate, I hate to in one way see it um, shuttered for a year or two. Uh, also by not, by waiting a couple of years and determining how you're really gonna use that building, if it's gonna be an elementary, there are some improvements to the building or some adjustments that change it from a sixth grade level to a K-5 level or whatever the situation might be. Secondly, I, I think there's been some good suggestions about uh, is, there some, is there some better way to disperse the students across the buildings in the district? Um, uh, 
And I just point out, do, does the district continue to need to use this space? Could this space go to another building along with students uh, as far as the personnel who, who are housed here and what kind of departments we do? So I, I would recommend in concert with the question you just asked and my answer about a year or two out, I think what the district needs to do is take another um, serious look at what facilities do we need in the next handful of years and how do we make best use of the, of the spaces that we presently have? And are there other ways that you can tighten your belt and use existing facilities that you own or whatever as to where you go? But you gotta remember that, for example, in this building itself, uh, we lease this space. So that's not a strictly general fund foundation aid money situation it's a separate category and one of the things that I think you might have lost in the last handful of years is looking at the implications of decisions financial decisions and how they impact um, certain categories of your budget and that would be that would be one of the recommendations I would make over the next couple of years that you really take a good look at that Sure. One question about if the, the buildings that are at capacity, would we need to think about restricting any open enrollment or interdistrict transfers or anything like that in this short term window where we do maybe have new kids move right into the area and there's not room for them, but we've got people coming from outside areas to those schools? Or do we think that there's capacity for a little bit of room? Maybe I could speak to that. I think um, I think we need to look at have a plan for how we do that. If someone moves into an attendance area, it's very difficult to say you're in, you're, you can't go in that attendance area. So just somebody actually moving, changing residents into the district, um, they may be replacing somebody who lived in that house and now moved. So you know, I don't think we want to get into telling people um, for. for trying to bus people to different areas. I, um, but I do believe that if there's somebody from another community that wants to open a role here, that we should have that discussion over the next month to six weeks and have a situation set up so that people know that if you're gonna open a role from outside the district into Shakopee, your options might be one, two, or three schools, not the full range. Um, secondly, uh, I know that we have people who, because of where they work or some other reason, um, would like to be at one elementary across town from where they, they potentially live because um, maybe their children can you know, go two blocks to grandma and grandpa's house to stay after school, you know, that type of thing. I, that's another, to speak to Susan's, Point is that's another thing that we should talk about and should we try and, and hold on some of those uh, that might add numbers to the two full buildings uh, and then the third point is I think we we need to talk about if a new development does spring up someplace and it happens to be in the attendance area of one of the really full buildings do and, and if it's transported do we really say okay um, I'm not saying to do this, I'm just saying you should discuss it and make a decision is, do we then take that island of development and say, okay, we cannot take you to this building at this point that might be in that attendance area. You're gonna to go to one of our other ele elementary buildings that does have space. And we do that until such time as you open Pearson or make adjustments in the attendance areas. Um, it's not like you have um, a population that's been in a elementary building for four years and now we're moving them. This is somebody who moves in and I would I would suggest strongly that the education that children are getting in one of our elementaries is not different or the opportunities aren't different from the other elementaries and if we were providing bus transportation to one we could just as well 
have that go there because our bus transportation is not on how many miles a child rides. Our bus uh, costs are by the student and whether you live 15 miles out of town and get a ride or whether you live two miles out of town and get a ride, we pay the same amount. It's, it's the aggregate of what we're paying um, is what really the big deal is, not how far somebody lives uh, from one of the buildings. All right, well, I don't know if this was written by design, but there isn't actually an action item on here, but we can certainly add an action item on here to um, accept a uh, new recommendation. We just did uh, put words in your mouth with a particular uh, motion because I hesitate to sometimes do that. Um, I don't want to paint, you know, paint you in the corner. But if you believe that that to be the case, it's just someone just needs to, to make the motion to not open uh, Pearson as an elementary building for 2018-19 um, and direct the administration to make appropriate uh, adjustments. So we recognize that we'll be able to shift some of that cost over to for a little bit of the high school. We recognize that by not opening up Pearson as an elementary that would not preclude us from repurposing that building should we decide that there is a better option for us uh, that works within our, our you know, financial footprint here. Um, so it's not like we're going to throw uh, boards and nails up and leave it there. We, we have options. And that building's too good to, to not, you, you just don't, that building isn't a throwaway building by any stretch of the it, it needs to be used in this district. It's just, What's the best way? If that's an elementary school, then when you need additional elementary space and you can afford it, you do that. If it's something else that fits in a larger facility plan, then you do it and you're exactly right. I'll make a motion to approve John's recommendation to close or shut down Pearson for 2018-2019 school year. I'll second that. All right. I would just like to add, I think in different in a different circumstance, I think we, I don't know if I would be game for doing it right now, but we've kind of been talking about this for a couple months now, and I think it's better for the families to know that they're not moving. So I think that it's a necessity that we go on today. So I think we're making the right I agree with Tony, and I tend to think of things uh, at pro and con. And I've been noodling on this like Sean has been, and I can see some cons in terms of where we thought we were headed, being able to rebalance the, the different elementaries that are over uh, uh, extended, if you will. But I see a lot more, a lot more pros, financial stability, certainty, as Tony just alluded to, the flexibility it gives us to re-examine this um, in light of other facility needs. Um, it's certainly not something I anticipated at all. Um, but we have to make uh, sound decisions, and I think this is one that when I weigh the pros and cons, as I said, the, the ledger, the, the scale tilts very much in favor of pro, as much as recognizing there are elements to this that are not ideal, but that's just the way it is. Any other discussion? Okay, here we go. All those in favor of the recommendation is provided. Signify by saying aye. Aye. We'll save sign. That recommendation carries. Thank you. Thanks, John, for looking John. Yeah. And for the timeliness, because we asked you in the December meeting to come back soon. So thank you. Yeah. All right, you want to go ahead and move on? So I'll move on to uh, 921, the budget assumption discussion. Uh, this is the time of the year where um, in my past, I've been used to setting up uh, assumptions and working on a budget for the following year. I'm going to give you some information tonight that's, uh, that I think will uh, start that conversation and, and where we're going. It, it also comes out of the fact that uh, we now know that with Pearson not opening, then there are some implications of the future because if we were going to open as an elementary it would mean more deficit in the future because 
if we have a four hundred thousand dollar, five hundred thousand dollar deficit this year, uh, as I commented on earlier, we have to change that pattern and get back to at least at least level. And you you can't be carrying over deficits from year to year. So for eighteen nineteen, I think uh, I'm going to offer just some suggestions about uh, assumptions, and the finance committee needs to. Um, hone in on those uh, and come back in February with some real assumptions about what we would do with next year's budget. And we're, I've been receiving a lot of suggestions about what we can be doing. Uh, I really appreciate those. Um, people stepping up and helping me understand a whole lot of things, both uh, formally and then just informal communications. Uh, I also need to point out that this year we have two revenue streams that will not be available to the district next year. One of those revenue streams has to do with some of the funding for the construction, which when the construction's over, um, that was help for the general fund with purchasing or paying for some some of the things that the general fund would normally cover because we were in this construction mode, adding onto a building, that type of thing. There's about $400,000 of construction money that goes to those transition dollars that next year will not be available. So in addition to a continuation of $400,000 of uh, deficit at the end of this year, which we hope won't be there, but you know it could be. There's another four hundred thousand dollar hole revenue-wise that has to be made up somehow for next year because you you can't fall back on fund balances. We we want to save every fund balance dollar we have. Um, additionally, this year's revenue and part of the reason why uh, we're a little bit better off. I'm thinking at the end of this year than what I thought of we were going to be a month and a half ago is that you did sell some land and that's a $300,000 $300, revenue into this year's budget. It helps offset uh, costs, but that land sale is a one-year thing and it's not a continuing deal. So that's another pull from for next year from this particular budget. So now, now we're at four plus four plus three, we're up to over a million dollars in either revenue concerns or this year's deficit. I talked earlier about the fact that um, while we can move a number of things from Pearson to the high school for staffing and other uh, needs there. Uh, if we were to do what everybody kind of expected maybe 18 months ago in opening the high school, we have another potentially $400,000 or more um, in opening expense. Now, it's important for me to point out that that is not money for, quote, the academy curriculum and that effort. This is just the extra money for um, heating the building and the operations and the additional people for security and some of those other things. So um, I'm not saying here that this extra money is because we're moving to an academy model. This extra money is just when you bring on that amount of space, and you're trying to run that program, it's going to be, there's, there's money to opening up a building. And again, because we don't have a fund balance that would cover that for a couple of years until the building fills up with students. Um, so I think there's, there's expense there. Um, so potentially, and I'm going to use the term potentially, and I want to make sure that everybody that's listening to me now or will be listening to me, is potentially we're looking at a challenge of a couple million dollars next year. A couple million dollars of either revenue that was available to us this year that we can't get or 
other types of uh, expenses that could be there. Um, so assuming that that is the case, now we have to start looking at ways that, um, and what assumptions we can make to change that and move that down to where we're at least balanced. Now, some of that, um, you know, there's gonna have to be reductions in areas and we we would hope again that this year isn't, isn't uh, maybe as negative as a, we've uh, suggested tonight. Um, but, but we do need to get more in line with what your needs and revenues are with our expenditures. So the next step here is to study and look at what the district believes are our assumptions for next year and uh, what we're going to be able um, to do. Um, one of the things that we were biting off a lot next year um, with making the move and, and doing some of the other things is scheduling. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about your uh, registration guide. Um, there were a couple of steps left out in making an adjustment to our uh, high school schedule. We need to go back, in my opinion, and, and uh, fill in those holes and slow down some of the implementation that we hope to make over the next year or so. Uh, financially, but even more important to make sure it's done right. There are numbers of aspects of the academy model that, in my opinion, are uh, really good efforts to try and improve the opportunities for kids here in Shakopee for their education. And there are, uh, it's a, a grouping of things that other districts are doing, maybe not calling it an academy model, but the uh, type of learning community, the, the smaller group, I think the experiences of having uh, business and industry in the community through your champions group and whatever coming in and uh, providing that real life experience for the students, the chance for internships and some of the other things that our uh, chamber, businesses and industry in town have stepped to the plate and said we will help you improve the experience kids have to be job ready, to learn things with a hands-on method, and uh, and a number of other things that the direction the district has chosen to go is very positive. Um, my my point here, however, is is that there needs to be a um, every point needs to be well thought out and planned for, and then financed so it doesn't. So there isn't some gap that ends up causing us an issue after the fact. And so part of the situation along with the funding deal is, is that there's just some things that we need to make sure we have right in a step process. One of them is the, the schedule and we haven't had um, total buy-in to the schedule. So, we're actually planning to try and go back and fill in some of those gaps as part of our planning for next year. Um, we haven't settled um, a thing with our contract regarding the adjustment of the schedule, so we're working on that. That's uh, one of the things. There's just there's just some different things. So I guess my point is is that um, what I'm going to recommend tonight is is that. We understand, first of all, one of our assumptions is that there is going to be more expenditures projected for next year than revenues. So we're going to have to figure out how to balance that. And we can't go in and use fund balance to offset that or give us some time. We're going to have to take that head on. Um, as I said, we're presently working, uh, looking at other schools about uh, some of our expenditures and how those match up with other districts are we do we have more in some cases than than what other districts are doing and, and are being successful with? Uh, you know where can we make adjustments that 
everything will have some impact, but how do we uh, prioritize the impact? And where do we go to get the things that we need to do to get to that dollar figure, but have the least impact? And so um, what I'm suggesting here is, is that the board tonight agree that the uh, finance committee of the board work with the administration to work on those assumptions and things over the next uh, three or four weeks, come back in February with number one, a revised budget for this year, and if you approve that, and then start uh, laying out um, some of the things that need to be done for us to reduce our expenditures, if there's any way to maximize some other revenues that we don't know right now, and get to where we have uh, assumptions set up that then can be followed through on till we get to having to adopt the final budget probably as you should be. And uh, I know that's a, it's a big number. Um, I Hopefully we can whittle away at that. I think the, there are things that, that we can do to do that, but there is going to be some pain with this. Um, we're going to have to, in my opinion, not do some things that we would really want to do I think the main thing is to make sure that whether it's maintaining um, some of the quality elementary programs, some of the hopes for making improvements at the high school with, with uh, some of the aspects of the uh, academy model, uh, doing things in six, seven, and eight that make sense. We need to look at all of that and figure out how do we do the most we can on behalf of the students in the district and do that within the framework of what our finances will allow. And I, I don't really have more to say about that tonight other than you have a general idea of how much I think that problem could be next year um, and the fact that I believe we need to be using the finance committee to be the sounding board and help us direct uh, some of our work and then be bringing that back to the board. Maybe at the uh, second meeting of the month, the uh, you know, instructional meeting portion and, and then to uh, have some more things uh, for you at the February meeting. I will again stand for questions or listen to any comments the board members have. We normally want to have a draft budget, first draft, March, April, typically. So February, um, we need to have our assumptions to allow staff to come back with that draft. We know we don't approve it until June because wait and see what the state does, that's how the year ends. But February is a, is a reasonable timing then to have these assumptions baked or built, I should say. That also gives people some time and us the time if there have to be reductions that we can do it in a timely manner to give people most. Right. Um, we won't have all the answers by the February meeting, but the assumptions and what what your goals are need to be, in my opinion, adopted by the board. Right. Can't disagree with anything you provided us and we need we need these facts, we need this reality in order to make informed decisions. So, hard to hear, but appreciate your, your work to this point. Some comments? No action here other than the recommendation would be to stay the course. Stay the course, and, and uh, the board is comfortable through consensus that we work with the Finance Committee. Uh, to, uh, to keep the process moving and come back with those assumptions and, and to listen to those suggestions from wherever they may come about ways that we can be uh, more efficient and effective. Okay, we'll move on to 9.2. I'm just going to make a uh, quick uh, comment here about the, where we're at. Um, our facility rental uh, 
things are becoming outdated simply because we haven't acted to change those in a while. And secondly, with the new nice facilities we have that we need to uh, take a look at, um, you know, how are we going to charge for those things? Uh, so the uh, staff has put together a uh, draft sheet of how we might change that. This is not board policy. This is simply um, setting fees for using different uh, aspects of the facilities of the district and then what kind of support services somebody might have, might have to pay for. Um, and what you pay depends on whether you're a school district activity or some other kind of supported uh, Shakopee group or you're coming in to make money by using our facilities or B, you're from outside the district and you just need to use our facilities. So we gave them a draft tonight to look at. Uh, I believe the, the committee felt pretty comfortable with what that draft was. We will make it available to everybody starting tomorrow. Uh, I wasn't looking. Uh, we said it, would, it got in here that I was going to provide copies. We will put it up tomorrow, uh, and we're not taking any action tonight. Um, so that how it was phrased here is on me, and I apologize. I think there are some legitimate steps to, that you go through to do this type of thing, and the Finance Committee is the first place. We'll also talk to the Citizens Finance Committee. Um, could we run it or something this week? <coughs> and then we'll come back with that recommendation and we'll take input from anybody that <coughs> sees it or whatever. But um, it, it basically, uh, as I said, still differentiates between what kind of a uh, group you are, whether you're one of our school sponsored activities, whether you're uh, something from the city or some group in town, uh, and then what your intent for using it is. And if you're using it for fundraising or something else, then you're going to pay some fees. And we, we're we going to differentiate more uh, is the recommendation between, let's say, using the field house, which is a new facility with extra stuff versus using an elementary gym. And I think it's really important to point out that this district has, for years, tried to make uh, school district facilities available when it's not uh, for somebody's monetary gain or something like that. We have our buildings open a lot. Uh, the reality is when you open something like the field house or something else, now you get people that are using it outside the regular school day, weekends, different kinds of things, plus it's kind of upscale uh, because there's six courts there versus just going to an elementary gym where there's one, right? Uh, but I don't think that, it, that I would recommend it. I don't believe the boards want to, board wants to just say we're not going to do things. But if you do want to use one of the more higher <coughs> level places that you're then going to have to, you know, you're going to have to pay for that. That we just can't let that go. And so that will be evident in what uh, our initial draft was. It's just a draft. It's a strikeout. We don't even have the you know, a clean copy. Take a look at that if you have feedback, um, you know, let us know. And the, uh, like I said, the board committee, uh, finance committee will be working on uh, finalizing this. We'll also be talking to the city because we're great partners. And I want to point out that the city of Shakopee has been a great partner with the school district for facilities in this community. When you look at all the school sites that have um, outdoor fields and gyms that are being used all the time. When you look at the city's complexes that they that they have, that the school uses, there's uh, reciprocal things. That all is, uh, I think, made this a special situation and something that I, as a superintendent, really appreciate. Um, there are, however, some specialized deals like ice arenas and field houses that are kind of different and they need to be they need to be treated different and we will we'll try and weave that in so that um, the district like the city with that upscale facility uh, is able to maintain it and keep it nice and serve people and it's just there's more expense to having those and running them so 
with that caveat, I, I'll just I'll leave it there unless there's questions. Mary? Is the Jim Central considered elementary? Uh, yeah, and I think the gym at Central is used. It's used for community ed, I believe, Bob, right? There's community yeah. ed activities there. I for our early shelter programs yep. Yep. and community ed classes in that, in that facility. So. Yep. But it's considered an elementary? Is it considered an elementary? It's, commit, it's considered right now a preschool uh, activity, but I would put it into the elementary category okay. as far as if you're just looking at what we would do with the gym. Okay. Comments for John? Facilities? All John, right. You know, um, question for John. How do you want your how do you want comments funneled from us to I, you through? Yeah. yeah, you can just if if you as board members have um, comments, either catch me and tell me or send me, you know, something in draft form that okay. you want me to look at. Anybody in the public that's got some ideas about that, if they look at it. You probably find my email pretty easy. Um, I prefer you don't call because I have other things that I need to do. But if you get it to me either by paper or by email, that's great. And we will we'll make sure that we're collecting those just like we're collecting other suggestions about how we tighten our belts. So that would be the, the best way to help get to me. All right, Nancy, come on up, 9.3. So uh, we uh, uploaded to board book today the full high school registration guide and as you know you acted already today on the middle school guide which got right before winter break and uh, on the course proposed uh, changes on courses for um, the secondary level. Um, one piece though that John and I wanted to kind of talk through with you is uh, the change at the front of the registration guide for the high school um, and considering that we've determined that we'll be delaying um, the new schedule for at least one year and staying with uh, the seven period day that we currently have in place at the high school which would mean that uh, we would need to um, change a few things at the beginning of the guide as it pertains to um, the uh, graduation requirements, basically delaying some of the implementation of the graduation requirements. So I always think of Reggie on these days because Reggie likes strike through, but to keep things <laughs> as simple as possible, this is from last year's guide, the packet that is uh, that is there. That's a, just basically a delete. And this is the ad, which is a one page document, which just shows that um, for our class of 2019, we will just keep graduation requirements as they are currently. So if you look in that first column, uh, where it says 2019, you'll see uh, it's virtually the same as it is for the class of 2018 if you're comparing it to the old language. And because we'll be going through a process of taking a closer look at options for other types of schedules moving forward, um, it seemed to be the logical thing in terms of advising our, our students um, to assume we're, we're on the seven period day for at least one year and so if you notice then it looks like we have or it has uh, 2019 20 and 21 on the same uh, graduation requirements with the incoming freshmen which is our class of 2022 they'll be freshmen in, in the fall of 18 um, they will start um, to have uh, some additional requirements like freshman seminar they'll take that right away next year um, as well as uh, be required to complete program of study electives. So um, we have a little bit of time then. To, if you look at the narrative at the right below um, the chart where it talks about daily schedule, uh, potential changes, uh, for sure the class of 2019 would not see any changes because they'd be on the exact same schedule, uh, but potentially 2020 
and beyond could have some modifications um, based on the type of schedule that would be chosen. So it could be that they'd be asked to take additional electives um, if we add uh, a schedule that has requires or allows for kids to have more choice, that type of thing. So I just want to make sure that the substitution does make sense to the board. And, and really when you look at um, everything else course descriptions, you were given a copy of that prior to the spring break for the courses that were due uh, for next year. And uh, it's just the first pro uh, portion of the guide that had some modifications, and those modifications are here. It's around the graduation requirements. Questions? Just one thing, that's right. So financial literacy will not be required. It would be uh, dependent on our ability to get another schedule that would allow for that to fit within uh, within this our graduation requirements. We're, we're not recommending that happen unless there's a schedule that would make it more viable. <coughs> so the real difference, though, this isn't a question; it's an observation on my part. I want to make sure I understand the real difference between what we had previously and anticipated going forward in the block schedule, which would now not happen, is just simply fewer elective credit as part of the graduation requirements, but then there's fewer graduation requirements. So instead of the 60 plus, whatever it was, it's now the 48 or the 49. Right. So whenever you do graduation requirements in fairness to families and kids, you always want to give them sort of uh, indication of a four-year look. And so without um, knowing for sure what the schedule will be beyond one year, we, the safest thing to do was to assume a seven period day. <coughs> so if you look here, um, 48 is out of 56, which is what you get in a four year program of a seven period day. And then um, in 2022 and beyond, if we were still on a seven period day, um, we would go up one, so it'd be 49 out of 56. Um, so if you notice the difference, if you just go across, you can see English stays the same, that's required by the state. Uh, math stays the same, that's required by the state. Uh, social studies actually exceeded state standards um, and requirements, so you can see there's an adjustment there. And then science, fine arts, all of those are mandated by the state. We'd be local control choosing to add freshman seminar and program of study electives. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nancy, I'm going to try to put it in simpler English for me. If we had eight periods, oh. that's 64 over a four-year high school correct. career versus mm -hmm. the 56. That's correct. So correct. it's a difference of about eight classes because we're going from mm -hmm. eight to what was planned to be an eight-year or an eight-period program, an eight-course program to a seven correct. that we're currently on. So it's just simply changing the numbers around. They still have to meet the same graduation requirements for the state. For the state. They're still going to have the same program of study under the cat under the uh, academy program. None of that changes. It's just simply fewer graduation requirements because the number of classes that the kids will be taking would be one less per day. Correct. So or over a two yeah, days. with the 64, like you said, Reggie, there was more opportunity to incre increase requirements. Right. And without that ability, that's why we are, we're deferring on financial literacy, you know, because there's not as much room to add requirements. But there's still a slew of elective options. Yeah. It's no different than what it currently is, and frankly would be going forward in terms of the actual course offerings. It's just now instead of 64, it's 56. Correct. It will remain 56 yep. and, unless we determine. Well, change. unless we change it, I'm just saying yeah. hypothetically. Okay. Yep. Shifting when it comes to the program of study, instead of it being this year's ninth graders, it's going to be this year's eighth graders that will be the first class that will graduate through that three year or three program um, academy. 
it'll be our incoming freshmen. Incoming if, if everything would stay the same. This year's eighth graders. Mm -hmm. This year's eighth graders. Yep. The first ones. And, yep. And the previous one would have been. It would have been our yep tenth. Yeah. All right. Uh, and we actually have to take action on this. Yes. Well, I, I believe I believe in order <clears throat> in order for us to do the uh, registration manuals, yes, we have to we have to move this along. Now, I will take responsibility for pushing this off as long as I could because we were trying to make the try to meet what the expectation was for potentially a different schedule and some other things. Uh, I'll take responsibility. We weren't able to get that done. Um, and there are some things that I think it makes sense for us to go back and redo and make sure that we're making the right decision. I don't think any of you uh, want, wanted this to happen this way, but it, it's the reality of a number of things that coalesced around um, the setting up of the registration manuals and actually making the change. Uh, and for whatever reason, I or others could not get things in place to be able to, to make the jump that we wanted to make. Um, so uh, after careful thought and looking at different things like negotiated contracts and other kinds of things with just getting things done, we need to, um, I, I waited as long as I could to make a, a suggestion of a change. Um, the reality is, and I'm the guy that don't make decisions till you have to, that's one of the things I live by because stuff always changes. So we waited as long as we could to make, to, to make things work, but we weren't able to do it. Therefore, this is an accommodation to uh, make sure that our registration can go out and we can get that going. And secondly, that we can go back and get some of the things in line that will help us move to another schedule with um, that that maybe makes more sense than what we were talking about or better than what we have. We just aren't able to do it right now. But I don't think, and I want to reemphasize this, this does not take away from the initiatives that the district has tried to put in place to improve the instruction and the education of students. And if we go and look at other districts, what kind of things they're doing. And I, I sat with a group of superintendents today at uh, Scott Family. Um, some of the things that are aspects of the academy model that, that this district has worked hard to move toward they're, they're being implemented by other districts, maybe not in the holistic way that you folks are trying to do, but they're good things. The school to work, you know, getting people to, to help give them real life experiences, having, uh, you know, the, the literacy, the uh, financial literacy course. There's other kinds of things that if you have more time, or you make some judgments about what things aren't quite as important, those are really good initiatives. It's just how do we do it and how do we do it within the environment that we have right now. This still keeps that moving. It just doesn't quite go in the same format as we thought it was going to be in the short term just because there's, there's some other things we got to do. And I don't think we're turning our back on the initiatives. It's just how do we do them appropriately and from a financial standpoint and getting a couple of these other things straightened out so that we can move forward. I want to I want to emphasize that or emphasize my understanding, Nancy, that this effectively, I don't want to say has no effect in the academies because it's not quite that black and white, but in a sense it is. We're still going to have the seven academies. We're still going to have the small communities learning. We're still going to have programs of study. We're still going to have the business and industry involvement with the curriculum and in our classrooms. We're still going to have the CAP program. The only thing that's changing is instead of having four classes on day A and day B, so eight classes, we're going to have seven classes each day like we currently have. That's the difference. Yeah. So in essence, it's going from 64 credits to 56 credits, which may say there's, because there's fewer classes the kids are going to have chances to take, 
that means over their career in high school, they're gonna have a few electives that they can take. They're still gonna have the same pool of electives to draw from. Correct. For all yeah. intents and purposes. So I feel like we're, we're bearing the lead here. This is something we're doing where we're staying with the seven period schedule. It may change, because I think there's some benefits to the block schedule that we've all mm -hmm. uh, are hopeful about, and there may be other options as well. But all the elements of the academy are still happening. It's just going to happen in a seven day period or seven period day. Correct. Yep. Okay. All academies, and correct me if I'm wrong, are not on the block eight. There, there are other right. there are other block programs, and what you're looking to do is to be able to ex expand the time that you could work on some of these classes so that you have legitimate time to really take them as far as you can. And what we need to do is, and we're already starting it, January 15th, we're going to be going back to the high school staff to get input about what questions do you have, what options are out there. Some of you have taught in other districts where there's been different kinds of block schedules. We're, we're just going back to fill in what some people might say is a gap in the planning to make sure that we we got it right, uh, if I can put it down. Yeah, I think it's about making sure we're taking the time to make sure that the schedule we want to move to is the right schedule. Um, most, most of the academy schools do some type of block. The one that we were looking at is the most dominant one, but there are definitely schools that are on different types of blocks or on a, even a seven period day. Um, and so, you know, I think the benefit of some of the block is basically with more periods, you get more choice. Yep. Um, uh, and longer periods of time makes it a little easier to interact with community and business partners. But uh, there's, it's certainly, like you said, it's the schedule is not the heart of the academy model. The schedule can help the academy model, but it is the small learning communities, teachers teaming around kids and having kids more frequently um, in that small learning community. Uh, having a program of study that though that's the heart no, the business partnership the transformation of the authentic learning that's the heart of the model Nancy is it fair to say that finding the class of 2021 even though this particular set of requirements doesn't require me to have completed the three uh, course uh, program of study I can still take those classes yes, yes. nothing stops me from, I just don't have to have that in order to graduate correct and a lot of kids will yes. do it naturally. And we're going to have to tweak a couple more things here, but this is what we need as a first step to, to make sure that we can register and keep things moving. I think we're already expecting the students to, in the next couple, three weeks, do the academy declare which place. academy they want to, want to be in. Those things are still going. Okay. Um, is it a motion we're looking for? Because if so, I'll yes. phrase it as I'll move that we adopt the revised uh, graduation requirements as presented and the impacts that it has in terms of implementation, such as scale. Is that adequate? Mm -hmm. She she said, she, uh, <laughs> I don't ever answer those. She said she got it. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe that that just approves us to, to move on with uh, with the registration manual too. So that yeah. Sometimes you've asked for it to be a first and second reading. I think the high school would appreciate it that that you. Well, the content didn't change. It's just simply right. this particular element. That's right. We saw You've seen the, the biggest yeah. change yes. right yeah. here. So, for their point of view, the sooner that you can approve the guide, the sooner they can keep moving. Okay. okay. We have a motion on the table and a second by Angela. Yep. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Always stay the sign. Thanks to Nancy and all the people that have been working on this, um, the high school uh, folks and whatever. It's, um, I've been holding them up for a long time. So. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. All right, item 10, new business action items. We do not have any of those. Item 11, other. We didn't have any other. 
I'm going to oh, just yeah, want to raise one, one thing. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Mary's being um, recognized at the state uh, school board's winter convention conference uh, where school board members from all over the state come. Uh, it's quite an accomplishment to become a 20-year board member. And there's been an all, she's been, in a, she's had other accolades as well. But this is a, this is a big deal. There's a special, uh, a special recognition on Thursday at the conference or the convention for Mary and some other people that have made those 20 and 25 year kind of things. And, and uh, we should all be um, appreciative. I know I am because I worked with Mary for a number of years uh, for that kind of dedicated service over time. So congratulations. <laughs> That's a big deal, and, uh, and thank you. All right, item 12, any committee reports? Hold on, get on the table, any committee reports? Mine is out for December. Okay. Sean? Sure. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. Travel safe. Bye. All right, uh, item 13, recognition of visitors to the board meeting. Okay, I'm 14, upcoming meetings. Oh, 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 all right. I'll have a more time. Thanks. Lou. Gene Krugel. 1862 Pinsamon. Thought I'd just uh, step up and say, I kind of won uh, almost a summation. It hasn't quite been a year since March, um, but a lot has transpired in that amount of time. Um, really, frankly, it, it's kind of disappointing, but I think the taxpayers have been sold to build the goods for quite some time, and that's the disappointment. Uh, first, we were told that the population is exploding, and we need a brand new school or second school or a bigger school to fit all the kids. Uh, we need to compete against bigger schools with better populations and better tax bases. So we need academies programs, we need long field, we need all of these things to make this competition be real for shop. Um, we have $12 million sitting in the bank. We need to do something with it. We need to do something now. This is a short amount of time where all of these things were purported by the school board and administration. What are the results? Well, we have a great campus being built that many junior colleges and colleges would be jealous of. And we have a school that's gonna be closed because we can't afford to keep it open. And yet the academies are full speed ahead, no matter come what may. In just in June, and repeat it again, we have a $700,000 surplus in this school year budget that we have money to deal with. Not even six months later, it's a four to $500,000 deficit. We spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on a consulting firm for budgets that was gonna do a great job that yielded more complications than it was worth. And nobody really talked about the $2 million shifting of funds and everything else that went on. It was never, the transparency isn't there. It's still not there. It's never been there. You guys are like literally driving a hundred million dollar boat and keep hitting icebergs, bigger and bigger and bigger icebergs. And you want to stay the captain of that boat. It doesn't make sense to me. Ships sink when they hit icebergs. Or if mistakes are made, captains get relieved of their duties. That's what it boils down to. That's frustrating. No one is coming forth with transparency to say the real truth or relieving themselves of the duties that they have made mistakes on. No one's fallen on the sword. No one is like full accountability across the board. That's the challenge. That's why people don't move on. 
that's what people are looking for. That's not happening. I would love to have more further conversations along these lines. That's the frustration that I have from strictly a monetary standpoint, but also too from the fundamental standpoint of like transparency. It's not there. People continually shift blame to those who are no longer here, and that has to stop. It's not a one or two person job. This is $12 million in less than five years on things that frankly didn't need to get spent on. That's the challenge. I'm hoping you guys are realizing like the mire that you're in, but it sounds like you just keep moving on. And I understand that it's a hard job to, you want to move on, but you have to like be accountable for what you've done. That's the challenge. I'm hopeful that you guys are understanding really what you're up against. I think you are, but I haven't seen the difference in the last three or four times that I've been here. It's the same thing. We're building Shakopee to be this great destination. Shakopee is not a destination right now. It doesn't need to be a destination. You need to take care of the people who are actually there and paying the bill. That's not a destination. That's Shakopee is a bunch of worker bees. It's a farm town, a bunch of worker bees that are just trying to have the kids go through school and get a good education. That's what Shakopee is. Everybody else wants Shakopee to be this grandiose thing that other people pay to come and play. That's not what Shakopee is. That's the problem. That's what's been the problem for five years, in my opinion. That's what I would, from my perspective, would like to see addressed. I would like to have some offline conversations because this isn't a back and forth uh, scenario, but um, that's what I would like to say. We'll move on to 14, which is upcoming meetings and important dates. And I guess at this point, I just refer to the schedule that we just approved today. Um, Bob on Wednesday that Greg alluded to earlier, and we get back together with some policy uh, policy setting and a learning session on the 22nd, Bob on the 24th, and then um, seat back on the 31st. Um, oh, that's communication. Seat back is Tuesday. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay, and we'll get these published as, as always. And just stay with status quo with our committees that we're on right now. Um, status quo at the moment is quickly as I can get these rearranged um, as necessary. The nice thing is we've got everything in one document, so hopefully it won't take too much work to uh, make the changes. Um, I will say, as we're looking at readjusting, there's a lot of meetings, a lot of events, and so. Board members have already been called on to do uh, quadruple time, and that is not slated to change at all. So um, just prepare yourself for another robust year of meetings. All right, um, if nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and go to item 15 and move for adjournment. I'll make that motion. There you go. Second, Tony. Any discussion? Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Post the sign. We are adjourned.